Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Beef and Lamb Genetics Leading the Flock webinar on breeding low methane sheep. We thank you all very much for taking time out of your evening to join us tonight. Uh, tonight's webinar is proudly brought to you on behalf of the Cool Sheep Program, a three-year initiative supported by Beef and Lamb New Zealand and MPI. In a moment, I will introduce you to Mark Aspen, who oversees this program. But firstly, let's set the stage for this evening's topic. Uh, we know that the topic of methane is a subject that can stir strong emotions and different viewpoints. So it's important we clarify the purpose of tonight's webinar. The team have tailored this event to focus on discussing the opportunities through genetics for our sheep breeders. Previous research has shown that methane emissions in sheep are heritable, allowing us to establish a, a breeding value for this trait. Our focus, focus tonight is about harnessing the power of science and research to provide solutions and options in our sheep breeding sector. It is an important opportunity for our breeders not only to gain valuable insights, but also to interact with our industry experts and learn about the available tools that can be used with ram buying clients who are interested in sourcing low methane rams. Acknowledging that there will be a range of viewpoints on tonight's content, we encourage respectful commentary and questions throughout the webinar. Before we get to the lineup of the evening, we'll go through a few quick housekeeping notes. To allow us to maintain a better connection through the webinar, please ensure your microphones and videos are off. You can change the view on your screen by selecting view options as indicated on the slide here so that you can see both the speaker and the slide as they present. Along the bottom ribbon of your screen, you'll see the speech bubble chat icon. Please use this to ask all questions during the presentations. We're planning to pose all of your questions to the speakers at the end of the webinar through a dedicated Q&A discussion rather than after each speaker. This webinar is being recorded, so if any of you need to leave us partway through the webinar, um, there will be an email sent out following the webinar containing a link to the video recording of this evening's event. If you have any technical issues during the webinar, please text Becky. Her details are here on the screen, but they were also in your registration email. If you happen to get booted out, she'll be able to help you get back in. Now, a quick look at what we've got coming up tonight before we kick into gear. First up tonight, we'll hear from Mark Aspen, who is Beef and Lamb New Zealand's Environmental and Greenhouse Gas Research Program Senior Advisor, which includes the Cool Sheep Program. Mark will provide us with an overview of the three-year program and what they're setting out to achieve. Then we're going to hear from Ag Researcher Suzanne Rowe, who will take us through on-farm measurement of methane, provide some insights into trait performance, potential changes within your flock and the latest research findings and international advancements around methane and livestock. Following Suzanne, we'll hear from uh, Beef and Lamb Genetics' Jason Archer reiterating the current and future methane breeding values and indexes available to breeders supported by Improve, and to which I'll, do, I'll then quickly run through both public and breeder Improve on where we can source and use this information from. Following all this, as I said, we'll have a dedicated Q&A session where on your behalf, I will ask this evening's speakers to answer all of the questions that you've posed during the webinar and give you the further opportunity to interact with the experts on the content described during the webinar. So without further ado, I'd like to invite Mark to kick us off by explaining for us a bit more about the Cool Sheep Program's plan. Right, well, thanks Sarah for that introduction. I am the uh, Cool Sheep Contract Manager for Beef and Land and along with uh, Cynthia Lawrence, uh, we drive the project. So um, accelerating the, the introduction of methane emissions in the New Zealand sheep flock through genetic selection, the Cool Sheep Program. is co-funded by Beef and Lamb New Zealand and the, and the MPI through the Climate Emergency Response Fund. And it's a project that's funded to around about $4 million and it's going to run to 2026. The project, this project's originated out of substantial investment from farmers through Pastoral Greenhouse Gas Research Consortium and the government, along with the New Zealand Agricultural Greenhouse Research Centre. 
From 2008, we were looking to find whether we could discover whether methane emissions uh, could be genetically controlled in ruminants, and this program came straight out of that. We achieved that through working with great science and with the New Zealand industry and beef and lamb central progeny test. This led to a pilot project involving some of you in 2019 and a world first initiative as we began to roll out this opportunity to reduce methane from our ruminant sheep uh, with, with genetics. We've had a lot of help and support along the way to get where we are today. And I really want to acknowledge all of those breeders that have worked with Ag Research and Beef and Lamb New Zealand in our path to get to where we are. And uh, their ongoing commitment is certainly um, well welcomed and, and we thank you a lot for that. So the Cool Sheep Program um, has four core parts focused on supporting the national sheep flock on a trajectory to enhance productivity and reduce methane emissions using genetics. In the next three years, it will firstly increase the RAM supply, facilitate widespread phenotype measuring for methane in the breeding sector through the Ag Research Portable Accumulation Chambers, the PAC Chamber uh, service, alongside genotyping and selection accuracy, identifying low methane genetics in our national breeding flock, rams, if you like. Also in the uh, RAM supply, there'll be, we'll be developing the package of information with an environmental index that is going to facilitate progress to lower methane while still getting that productivity, which we, which we really hang on to and want to make sure we maximise. So it's a complete package of look that we're going to be doing in there. Secondly, in the program, we're going to enhance improve. Uh, we're going to hear a bit about improve, but from our perspective, develop improve to capture and present the data using both breeding value and creation of the environmental index and develop the information systems within the improve to link RAM sales to commercial farms and capture credentials for their on-farm information, for the farmers' on-farm information. This will be a substantial part of the project, linking those things together. Thirdly, the third leg of the, of the program is the national impact. We're going to be building the systems here to monitor the genetic flow and ensure that this will be accounted for in the national greenhouse gas inventory, so that it counts for the New Zealand sheep industry and for the individual farmers and for the country. The fourth part is about awareness and outreach. We really want to effectively communicate these advances as they are developed using multiple farmer informed and bespoke approaches. And so we really want to keep engaged with breeders and commercial farmers and understand what what how we can make this project work really well. Next slide. So cool sheep program, who's in the team? The project manager is Cynthia Lawrence and I'm the and I along with Gus Manatza from MPI are the contract managers. We have a beef and lamb based steering group. Uh, that consists of Dan Breyer, Jason Archer, and myself. And overall, we have a project governance group. Um, Phil Ware, a farmer from the Waikato, uh, is, on, is the chair of that, along with Janine Alfield and Dan Breyer. So we've got a pretty lean team here that we're trying to really make this thing fly with. Um, and, and, we've, and after building the Cool Sheep program, the long-term outcome is to use these genetics to realise beyond 2035 a measurable lowering of baseline methane emissions from our national sheep flock. That's what we're here to do. That's what the bat, we're, we're building the pieces to make sure that our, our sheep flock can continue to prosper and reduce its emissions. Back to you, Sarah. Thanks, Mark. Great to hear the plan ahead for this project. Um, as I mentioned, and for those of you who might have just joined us, um, please send any questions through for the speakers uh, using the chat function, and I will ask them on your behalf during our Q&A session later in the webinar. 
Okay, so now we're going to move to our next speaker, um, Suzanne Rowe, who's a senior scientist at Ag Research, and she's going to take us through a number of key aspects for breeders. Thanks, Suzanne. Um, so uh, somebody who has their microphone on, can you tell me that you can see my slides? Thanks, Suzanne. We can we can see your slides. Perfect. Thanks, Sarah. So um, thanks, everyone, for coming along. Um, I know it's a really busy time of year at the moment, um, so uh, really appreciate your time. Um, I'm going to run through uh, some of the science that we've been doing over the last 10 years. Uh, most of it's focused on a research program that uh, myself and John McEwen have been running. Um, and, and I'm going to go through uh, the practical aspects of measuring for methane, but, but, but also talk about, as I say, some of the science and try to dispel uh, some, some of the fears that, that some people might have around, around the program. So first of all, what is enteric methane? Um, Enteric methane is is produced by ruminant livestock. So um, it's it's I always say it's a beautiful system. It evolved over forty million years, and uh, basically the animal eats complex uh, starches like cell walls. Uh, can't break it down themselves. So microbes sit in the gut and they ferment those cell walls. They they break down the starch, produce essentially um, fatty acids or carbs for the animal. Um, and whilst they're doing that. Fermentation gives off a gas. It's 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 usually hydrogen, and that hydrogen uh, is is combined with carbon by um, ancient bacteria or methanogens. Uh, they produce methane, and it's belched out of the front of the animal. So it's a very simple system. Uh, the important thing to note is that different animals have uh, different microbial communities in their gut. Uh, this seems to be a a, a genetic trait, and the um, different microbes have slightly different fermentation pathways and different fermentation pathways give us different levels of gas. So essentially what we're doing here uh, is picking the animals that digest their feed um, in, in a way that gives off less methane uh, and, and there are naturally occurring variation amongst our populations. So um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a relatively benign um, breeding program. Um, the reason that, that, that we're looking at it is because um, globally methane from enteric emissions uh, has been seen as a, as a real issue. And in countries such as New Zealand, um, Ireland, Uruguay, it's it's a big proportion of our total greenhouse gases. So, so in New Zealand, 80% of agricultural emissions come from um, animals breathing out methane. Uh, and that's 35% of, of our total greenhouse gases. So uh, when it comes to answering the, the global call for everyone to, to, to lower their emissions, uh, which most countries have, have, have signed up to, uh, we're really left with very little choice but to, to include enteric emissions um, in, in, in our sort of targets. So um, how do we do that? How, how do we lower uh, methane uh, from, from grazing livestock? Uh, there, there are four current research streams. Uh, one is on on feeding animals. If you feed brassicas, that changes the fermentation pattern, so so we get less methane. But it's really hard to work out what level to to feed in the diet, um, and 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 how to go about that. Um, methane inhibitors are, are are a really active uh, area of research, and they've been shown to work really really well in systems where you're seeing the animals and feeding them every day. So so they look as though they're going to be um, really impactful in things like dairy systems, um, but quite difficult to deliver in grazing livestock. There is work on uh, ways to deliver using um, boluses, um, but it's it's ongoing research, and at the moment it's not at the level where where it can be employed on farm. Vaccines. Uh, vaccines are uh, something that um, people are really hopeful that they will have a, a, a big impact. Um, but it's still likely to we're still likely to be around ten years away from a vaccine. So um, identifying the vaccine target and then getting a vaccine that works and then testing it is going to take an awfully long time. Uh, so um, vaccines, as I say, it's something that's hopeful, but it, but but far into the future. And then we come to breeding. I'm a geneticist. That's what I'm going to talk about today. Um, we've shown that we can breed for low methane. We we can select the animals that that have a a, a rumen fermentation that's, um, you know, I, I ideally suited for for our systems and and gives us less methane. Um, so I'm going to talk about breeding for low methane, the challenges we've had, um, what we've seen to date. Uh, and how much methane we can expect to mitigate using using breeding alone. 
So I'm going to spend some time at the start of my talk going through the science and I'm going to try and address some of the fears that I often hear. I'm going to try and you know address some of the concerns that people have. Um, low methane animals in our experience are not less profitable. They're not less disease resistant. They don't have slower growth. They don't have small rumens. We're definitely not selecting for skinny sheep. They thrive well in a low input system. And, and our science for lowering methane doesn't depend on any particular metric. It doesn't matter how, how the accounting is done downstream. So I'm going to walk through some of the science that, that's, that's you know, enabled us to come to those conclusions. And I'm happy to take questions about it afterwards. Once I've done that, I'm going to talk about in practice what happens if, if, if you would like to have your animals measured using portable accumulation chambers, um, how to, how to get breeding value should you want them, what to expect on measurement day, what to do with the BVs or what you might do with the BVs, um, and how we think the government might recognise this commitment, and, and, you know, and, and it is a big commitment. Um, I won't talk a lot about that because I think Sarah will, um, but, I'll, but I'll, I'll, I'll focus on the, on, on the first three points. And, and when, we when we talk about research, um, there's been a lot of investment over the last decade. We've been incredibly fortunate uh, that we have methane selection lines. They were started by John um, about 14 years ago. Uh, he had the foresight to, to start trying to breed for methane uh, just, just, just to see if it was heritable and, and if it would work. So breeding for low methane and breeding for high methane and then comparing those animals uh, to see how they differ. Um, we have 750 ewes uh, in a research flock and we have been using a low methane ram in that research flock but also selecting those animals for low methane uh, for the last five years so I'm going to talk a bit about the results that we see in a, in a, in a flock um, where methane is, is considered a trait rather than single trait selection um, and I'm also going to include data from central progeny test flocks that, that we have in New Zealand and, and the national records that we've collected. And there's around 25,000 animals that have been measured today in New Zealand. So, so we've got a, um, a really comprehensive data set and had a really good look at you know, what's happening in these sheep. So major research questions uh, right from the outset, if, if, if you select a novel trait, uh, what's the impact on, on performance? Uh, will it affect feed efficiency, given that it's a rumen trait? Um, what's the impact on the on the physiology of the animal and the health of the animal? And what are the economics? What what, what are we gaining from introducing this novel trait to, to our breeding programs? And if we start with the, the, the selection lines, um, I'm not going to dwell on this, but um, the, the green line at the top is where we bred for high methane. Uh, and, and the purple line on the bottom is where we bred for low methane. The, the coloured lines at the start are the, the flocks that they, that they were drawn from. Um, and, and what you can see really clearly is that the lines are, are still diverging. Um, so basically the, the lows are bred with the lows and the highs are bred with the highs. There's only 100 ewes in each flock, so they're quite inbred at this point. Um, but we've continued to select for low and high and, and, and to use that as a, as a physiological model to, to look at the differences between them. And, and they've been a, a really, really useful uh, way of, of looking at the impact of, of breeding for low methane. So I'm going to start with myths one to three. And those are that... Um, low methane animals are, are, are less profitable, uh, less parasite resistant, and, and, and they don't grow as well. These are results that compare the breeding values for the low and high methane selection lines. So the green uh, is um, the, the low line and, and the red is the high line. And actually, there aren't many differences. Um, most traits are, are, are very similar, but there are some key differences. The first is methane and methane yield. And we are breeding for methane yield, which is methane per unit of feed intake. So we don't we don't want to just breed for less methane because um, methane is emitted when an animal eats. So if you want less methane, you just feed them less. That's not what we want. What we want is for a given amount of food, the animal to to produce less methane. So methane yield is 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 less in 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 the low methane animals. Another big difference that we saw right from the start was parasite resistance, uh, and we get a lot less parasites or, or, or faecal egg counts are a lot lower in, in the low methane selection line. Um, 
we don't really know why that is and and we worried for a long time that it was a it was a founder effect so we've been quite careful uh, about these results um and the other thing that we really see is is there's a difference in u weight so the the low methane animal is is a smaller u than than the high methane animal most of the other metrics um with the exception of a little bit more wool and 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 a bit more fat um are, are, are basically very very similar in both lines but in terms of maternal worth when we take the lines um we see around a, a um a 12 dollar gain from from the low in the low methane lines so hopefully some of those myths are dispelled but on saying that it it, it is you know a, a very small subset so so we are quite cautious um when when we when we talk about these lines so around i think six or seven years ago we started to collect data from more flocks and what we've done is collect data uh from thousands of animals over many years and and this was all published last year um so i'm going to talk about adult u traits first we've got a data set here where where some traits are, only have 9000 records and some traits have 20000 records but if there was going to be an effect at this level of of population data we would really expect to see a significant impact and this is methane per unit of of dry matter intake or feed intake so this is methane yield and what i'm looking at is the genetic correlation so if something is genetically correlated if 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 i breed for one trait and it's genetically correlated to another then the other trait will respond um and the strength is based on uh, the the percentage. So um, if it's a hundred percent correlated, then then you'll get an equal response. Um, if it's only ten percent correlated, then you, then you'll just get a small response in the in the same direction. So what I've done here in yellow is to highlight the traits that are significantly correlated to methane. Um, so live weight at mating is significantly correlated. Um, and the, the strength of that relationship is 30%, so um, low to moderate. Um, and oh, something's happened with this graph. Uh, this this um, is wool, and wool is, again, um, moderately negatively correlated with methane. So what that means is, is a high or low methane animal is lighter at mating, but it has more wool. And then I'm going to look at body condition score because this is a concern that people have is that body condition score is being affected. In fact, this correlation isn't significant. It's showing a low to moderate trend, but not significant. So we're keeping a watching eye on body condition score that it might change slightly as we breed for low methane, but we don't have any significant evidence at the moment that, that, that it will do so. So then we go on to carcass traits. And again, we've got between six and 20,000 records for these, and, that, and this is fully published. And what we see with the correlation with um, methane yield is that if you have um, high methane yield, you tend to have significantly more fat, and it doesn't really matter where we look, we're seeing more carcass fat. Um, and your dressing out percentage is lower. So that means that low methane animals, in other words, the opposite, they have low fat, uh, they have more lean yield um, and they dress out better, uh, which is where we're seeing those profitability differences that that, that we see from, from, the, from the low methane line. And finally, I want to look at feed traits. We don't have as much data. This, this is a, a gap that we're trying to fill. It's very, very expensive to look at feed efficiency, um, but, but we're trying really hard to, to, to fill that gap. And we looked at what happens when we put low methane and the high methane animals um, in, a, in a feed efficiency system. We feed them for six weeks and we examine exactly what they eat and when they eat. And what we found with the, the low methane animals is that they, they eat less per meal, but they eat more often. They eat more slowly, um, but they actually eat more in total. We saw that they gain less body weight per kilo of feed. Um, suggesting that they might be less feed efficient. Um, but that doesn't account for the fact that um, with a high methane animal, although it might put on more body weight per kilo of feed, a lot of that is fat. Um, but we didn't see anything that that concerned us or, or worried us uh, or, you know, or, or, or we thought was having a major effect on, on the animal. Uh, but again, uh, something that, that, that needs to be continue to look at those relationships. 
So one of the early results that we presented was room and differences. And uh, we did a trial very, very early on. And we've always presented all, all of the work that we've done as it appeared. And we looked at extremes of the lines. And there was a 20% difference in rumens. No, um, that was just a few animals we've we've added over the years. Each year we kill around 40 to 50 animals um, from the lines and, and we do a really detailed uh, look at the alimentary tract. You know, we dissect it out, we weigh the rumen, we weigh the reticulum. And what we've seen when, when we have a full data set and, and not extremes is that there's a 6% difference between the highs and the lows. Um, and that the highs actually have a 6% bigger rumen uh, and they have less papillae and less surface area. So when we look at what that actually looks like in a full data set, including controls, um, so a, a few years on, we can actually dispel myth four. So myth four was that low methane animals had small rumens. And what we'd published was low methane animals have smaller rumens than high methane animals. And that's that statement is true. But when we managed to do controls, what we saw was that actually, if we look at pure rumen volume, low methane animals had um, about the same or even slightly lower, uh, um, sorry, um, we, they had very similar rumen volumes to um, the, the CPT and, uh, and the research flock. Um, but the high methane animals had big rumens so they had big rumens for total volume and they had big rumens when we compared it per kilo of carcass weight. So low methane animals don't have small rumens. Um, in fact, for the, the some of these research flocks, animals have, have, have smaller rumens than the low methane animals, but high methane animals definitely have big rumens. Um, so um, hopefully that will allay some people's fears that, you know, we're, we're breeding for low methane, low um small rumens because we we really don't appear to be. So now I want to talk a little bit about economics. I want to talk about um, the impact that that we might be having if we start selecting for low methane um, and, and where we weight the trait. So um, if we add methane to our index, we are assuming that that it has a value and that it's affecting profitability in some way. So we've looked at a, a likely range of prices that have been cited by different papers um, and, and different organizations over the years. So along the bottom here are um, dollars per ton of, of, of carbon. Uh, so, so economic weighting. Uh, this blue line is proportion of maximum progress in, in the New Zealand maternal worth uh, index. And this orange line is proportion um, of uh, progress, genetic progress for methane. And what we see is if we don't put any weight on methane at all, and, and we say, no, nope, it's worth nothing, but we monitor it, we get 100% um, progress in our in our index. Um, and actually, we still get a little bit of progress on methane. So we're actually lowering methane a tiny bit without doing anything. If we uh, value methane at um, $100 a tonne, then we are making roughly 60 to 70% of the gain that we would have made in, in, in maternal worth. So we're certainly not making any losses. In fact, we're still making 70% of the gain. And we're making around 70 to 80% of the pro total progress that we could make in methane. And we've looked at this and we actually think that um, probably the, the sweet spot is around here, around the $50 per ton mark. Uh, that gives us 80 to 90 percent of the progress that we would be making. So we're not we're not slowing our progress uh, and it gives us around 50 percent of the potential progress that we could make in methane. Um, and, and at the moment, that's that's sort of where we see um, the, the, the optimum economic weight. But of course, we can't know that until we know what the cost is. So this is just a hypothesis given on how we see the the, the index changing. So we then went on to think about what happens to individual breeding values in terms of progress. So these are the individual traits in the in the, in the maternal index. Green means that we're making pretty much, you know, very close to, to full progress. And red means that our progress is really starting to slow. Um, and along here are again yeah, in dollars uh, weights for weights for the trait. 
And what we see for the individual traits is that if we don't put any any value on pack methane at all, then we're making really good progress. Apart from U fleece weight, a U fleece weight, we're not making very good progress in, and, that, and that's just because of the way the index is going. And we're making very little progress in, in, in methane. If we thought about using um, a, a, an, an intermediate weight, so 40 to $50 uh, a ton, then we've got a little bit of slowing of um, our, our, our key traits, but they're still green. We're still making um, reasonable progress. Uh, we're starting to make uh, quite good progress in methane. And the only trait that we are starting to see a reduction in is this body condition score, but by a tiny amount. Um, so if we were to um, look at the, the selection intensity here and consider the, the body condition score uh, reduction, it would probably take us something like 20 years to see a half, half uh, score reduction, uh, by which time uh, we could easily have made something like um, 30 to 40% difference in, in methane. So, so the relationship is, 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 is there, but it's very, very small uh, and, and, if we want to control for it, the obvious thing to do is just make sure that we measure body condition score and 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 we monitor it, you know, and, and we don't allow it to drop. So I'm going to move on to what to actual data now. We have been measuring flock two six three eight, which is a um, um, maternal worth flock. Uh, it's 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 high performance. We have been measuring methane breeding values, uh, and and we've been looking at the impact. So this is the distribution of breeding values in in flock two six three eight for the twenty twenty one born animals, and you can see that it's it's slewed slightly below zero because we've been selecting for for less methane, uh, and our average breeding value is 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 about um, zero point two five grams. Um. Our sweet spot is probably again around around the the fifty dollars a ton. So we would make ninety percent of our progress here, and ninety five percent of our progress. And and this is something to note. So we have modelled um, predictive curves, and now what we're doing is we're going through flocks one by one, and we're looking at actual curves and using that to inform us. And we're also providing people, we can provide people with these curves for their own flock so they can make their own decisions. And what we've done with flock 2638 is we have actually valued methane at $100 a ton. So we're expecting that our progress um, is, is still, as I say, around about 90% what we'd expect, um, but that we're making around 25% of the progress that we expect in methane and um, we, we should see methane dropping. These are our actual results. So um, I'm sure you will get genetic trend graphs from, from your bureaus. And this is where we started genomic prediction for methane. And in fact, we see, we've seen a 4% drop, uh, which is uh, as predicted. And our uh, maternal worth figures have, have, have continued to go up and, and in green is the average flock. So, um, you know, we're, we're really seeing um, what we expected. In terms of you live weight, uh, we've seen a, a, a little bit of a drop. Um, and in terms of body condition score, so this is 0 0.1 point of a body condition score. So we've maybe seen 0 0.005. Um, so tiny drop in body condition score, but um, very, very little change. We've seen um, a bit of a drop in fat. Again, not a big, big drop, uh, and we've seen a bit of an increase in 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 lean yield. So, um, yeah, the 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 flock is really reflecting uh, what we predicted, but but we're going on, and you know we're continuing to monitor it, and 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 we're modelling other flocks. So I want to talk about myth six and that is and and this is you know quite credible all of our low methane animals today including our research flock have been bred uh in Invercargill on beautiful flat pasture um it's summer safe you know they they don't see many environmental challenges that they're, they're 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 really well looked after so one of the things that we did um a few years ago was to send some of our rams uh, up to Lanacost, uh, up in North Canterbury, uh, to more challenging conditions. So we sent our rams up and they were put in with the, um, the um, usual rams that are used up there, uh, bred to use, all run together. And then we followed uh, twins. Uh, so, so twin bearing ewes were separated out 
uh, and, and we followed their offspring through. So what we found was that um, the 2638 rams, uh, so the woodlands rams, saw more animals on the ground to start with. Uh, when we looked at the um, post-measure uh, breeding values for those rams, or those lambs, sorry, they were higher, uh, they grew better. Uh, and when we looked at those lambs as hoggets scanned in lamb, uh, we saw a, a higher scanning percentage. So um, basically the breeding values that um, went along with those rams were expressed in their offspring in a much more challenging environment, um, which, which you know, gave us faith that we're not just breeding animals for a soft environment. Myth seven um, is that, you know, we are breeding for um, GWP 100 or GWP uh, star. Everything that we've done, we've evaluated using um, a range of metrics, um, GWP 100, warming equivalents, and actually we're agnostic. You know, if if you if you build a car that uses less fuel, then it always uses less fuel. How you value that fuel or the cost of fuel is downstream. Um, so we have looked at um, how much methane or tons of carbon we think that we can physically save um, based on a scheme where um, methane is is in, introduced into the national flock and there's a half percent reduction. So um, that's around a thirty to fifty dollar per ton um, cost on methane. Should it be implemented, and we've looked at what that cost might be, and um, basically for about a dollar seventy two a ton of CO two equivalent, um, you know, we we can mitigate a, a ton of carbon. So so it's a low cost way. Breeding is a low cost way to 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 mitigate um, carbon, but it takes a long time and it's very very slow. So we approached the government and said. This is our anticipation. If we start breeding for low methane, don't expect anything to happen for the first few years because we have a generation interval to, to cope with. Then we will see a slow, slow rise, but it will be cumulative and we will see substantial gains in the decades to come. Um, and um, the government were, were supportive of that and invested in the Cool Sheep Programme uh, so that those that wanted to breed for low methane could have their phenotyping cost offset because, of course, there's market failure here. Um, if if we're looking at um, low methane animals um, being of value, uh, the, the commercial farmer should see most of the value and it's very, very hard for the breeder to pay for all of the phenotyping costs. So, so the idea was that uh, breeders get uh, phenotyping costs offset um, but that these breeders are, are, are breeders who are genotyping. So, so they help with those genomic breeding guys for calibration. Um, and that we would measure eight to 12 animals per sire uh, for the leading sires. And that we would measure 120 sheep uh, per farm uh, as, as a minimum. So I'm going to talk now about um, the actual practice of, of breeding for low methane and what we do on farm. Um, this is the, the the trailer that comes on farm with the portable accumulation chambers. They're not gas chambers, um, and and um, yeah, we, we've we've had a few people call them gas chambers. Please don't, um, because from a, um, a public point of view, it's a it's a really um, poor look on farming. Um, but um, we've got these portable accumulation chambers. They're very very simple chambers. Uh, they're simply a box. Um, animals are placed into the chamber. And there's a valve on top, and whilst the animal is in the chamber and and emitting methane, um, there's a valve that basically a, a, a machine is used to suck out a sample of air and to test the level of that methane. So the animals are all treated the same, they're all fed the same, they're all measured in the same way, and 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 are therefore comparable. And we take the gas emissions from the box um, over a 50 minute period and we predict the grams per day uh, for each animal. And that goes to beef and lamb and is converted in, in, into a breeding value. So breeding values are expressed in grams per day for, for methane and for carbon dioxide. The reason that we measure carbon dioxide is because carbon dioxide is a proxy for feed intake. And we're trying to calibrate feed intake and feed efficiency from the same measures. We're not there yet. Um, but 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 it's looking uh, promising. So um, our breeding values are based based on portable accumulation chamber emissions for a forty kilo animal uh, removed from pasture for one to four hours, and that that's our base rate. And we scale to that so as everything's comparable. Uh, we correct for contemporary group uh, as we would with with any trait. Um, we scale to a population mean. 
um, and 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 we fit fixed effects that we've seen uh, impact methane. So those are flock, um, the year of birth, the gender, um, the group that's being measured, uh, birth rearing rank, and and age of dam. Um, and and what happens then is that the the data feeds into to Beetham land system, and every two weeks a, a breeding values uh, are produced, and you will see a, a breeding value for your flock for methane emissions, not methane emissions per unit of feed intake. And that's a really important thing to note uh, because feed intake is already accounted for within the index. We didn't want to double count. So this is a methane breeding value and you'll also get a breeding value for carbon dioxide. And this is what the numbers look like. So 25,000 animals have been measured through PAC to date. Uh, the average flock has, has had around 340 animals measured and the research flocks here uh, are, are sitting at around two, two to 3,000 measures. Um, uh, so we have around 8,000 research uh, measures in total and around 16,000 uh, out on breeders' farms. Breeding values range from about one and a half to uh, below to one and a half above. Uh, and this is the variance that we see in flocks. So uh, the first line is the selection line flock. So you can see that uh, it's got a very, very broad range. Uh, but the other flocks actually also have a really broad range and they're all really similar. So what that's telling us is that every single farm has a whole range. doesn't look as though there's any particular trait that's been selecting for or against methane. It's benign and you've got animals quite cheerfully that are low methane grazing alongside animals that are, that are high methane. So it's not difficult to, to, to basically start to lower that range. If we want to breed for low methane, the first thing that we would ask people to do is to jump on the website. So this is Beef and Lamb website and register their interest. When you register your interest, somebody will call you. Uh, Neville Amy's and, and Wendy Bain, who many of you will be familiar with, book the pack runs with, with interesting breeders and they organize the allocation of the animals. And Ian Hampton, uh, it, for a long time it was Barry Van Vliet. A lot of you will have met Barry and, and many of you I know now will have met Ian. Coordinate the field work with you uh, and talk about pre-feeding and weighing and, 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 and setting up the trailer. And on the website are all the FAQs that you need to know. And I would say, you know, please take some time to read these. Uh, we've had a few issues where people have been, you know, really disappointed because there's been misunderstanding and FAQs haven't haven't been followed. So um, please, please re read the FAQs and, and the SOP. Um, animals must be fed well prior to measures. In order to express the differences between them, they need to be on good feed. And we ask for no major events for two weeks prior to pack. Nothing that's going to upset the gut, basically. Shearing, we know. We know if you shear a sheep that it it really boosts feed intake. So we try and avoid shearing around pack. Drenching, um, we have actually done some studies and, and it looks as though there's no real impact of drenching on on, on the gut. Um, but we're still cautious and, and, and zinc boluses, et cetera. So, so just try to avoid anything major in, in the two weeks before an, animals are measured. Before measure, we ask that animals are on really good cover for about three weeks prior. Um, we measure 84 per day, but we can't really get the trailer up someone's driveway for less than 120 animals. Um, the cost of moving the trailer from place to place is, is, is just too high. We measure in groups of 12. Uh, that's the most we can we, we can measure at once. And in each group, they must be a single flock and a single gender. And that's because of correction for, for, for contemporary group. Uh, and we ask that the animals that are presented are balanced, so 10 to 15 animals per sire. And they're unbiased. So there's a range of production BV. So we're trying really, really hard to look at what happens to other traits when we compare them with your methane breeding value. If you only measure your best animals, we're going to get biased results. So they, you know, they they won't be indicative of what will happen uh, in the big bad world later on. So really important to to not just pick a, you know, pick your best animals and measure them or, or your worst, but 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 a range. Um, two weeks prior, we ask you to send in the IDs of your animals, their sires, their weights, so we can work on group allocation. And one week prior, we ask you to, to, to really try and graze the madlib so we get a really good expression of methane. 
The day before, that big trailer is going to roll up your driveway. Uh, it weighs about three tons. So, you know, thinking about access, making sure that, that it, it can get up the driveway um, and it's not going to get stuck. And ideally, if we can turn it around, that's great. Um, Ian or, or another technician will arrive and, and set up the trailer. He needs lighting, uh, power and a clean water supply if possible and ideally shade. There is a roof on the trailer, uh, but, but you know, these, these units do get quite warm. And if it gets too warm, then we always stop because we don't want the temperature of the unit to be too high. Um, and obviously adequate sheep yards are needed to, to hold groups of, of, of 12 animals. On the day, animals are taken off feed um, one hour before the plan start and only one hour before the plan start. Um, animals are weighed and drafted into their groups of 12 for testing. So group one to four, the morning run, they stay off feed until they've all been measured and, and we fit time off feed for each of those groups. The afternoon runs, groups five to seven, they've got to be sent back out to pasture so that they're grazing and they're only removed again one hour before the planned start of afternoon testing. And those protocols are really, really important so that we have comparable measures. Um, and again, the animals for the, for the next day have to be drafted and back on, onto pasture. They must be grazing uh, for the full time up to, up to the time that they're taken off to be measured. Uh, that's really important. Um, if you bring all of your animals in and and put half of them on a bare paddock and measure them the next day, then then you know we'll really see it in the measures. So measuring methane, uh, as you saw in the video, hopefully sheep are loaded on really quietly and calmly in groups of twelve. Um, we just use a wand to capture the ID. Um, air temperature and pressure is recorded. That's so we get the the gas conversion right. So the gas is 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 measured in moles of gas. That's converted to liters and grams. Uh, an Eagle 2 monitoring device is used um, and, and we check that that monitoring device uh, is, is taking sound measures by carrying uh, single gas canisters with us and, and gas checks are done daily. Uh, we measure methane, we measure carbon dioxide and we measure oxygen and we measure it at 0, 25 and 50 minutes um, and then the animals are released. If the animals are really big and really heavy, then we cut the measure down to probably around 35 minutes uh, so as the, the, the gases don't get too high, high in the chamber. We don't want to expose them to, to really, really high levels of carbon dioxide. Um, and data, um, as I've said before, is sent back for pro processing and, and, and loading into improve. Um, gas measures are converted to grams per day. Um, I, I've said that. Uh, data scale to the contemporary groups of 12 that were set up in the field. It's adjusted for time of feed, so it's comparable. And the breeding value is estimated within the genetic engine on, on, on a two-weekly basis. And the BV should be available to you from your bureau, just the same as, as, as any other BVs. We really wanted to make sure we set this up so it was simple. Um, so breeding values, what do they mean? So they're an indication of how your animals compare for absolute or total methane emissions per day. Total methane emissions, not methane per unit of feed intake. An animal with a lower methane will have a negative breeding value, and that's really important. So ranking goes from low to high. So a minus is a good thing. Um, they don't account for feed intake or size of the animal, and they're not yet included in the index, um, but we're working towards that, and, I'll, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that next. What are people doing with these breeding values? Well, at AgriSearch, we put a value on them of $100 a tonne for our research flock. And we have been valuing um, minus one grams of packed methane at $6.81 or 681 cents in our index. Uh, and we've seen two to 3% per year drop, but we anticipate that we will be looking at half of that in, in industry for, for an optimum sort of contrast between um, maintaining productivity. So what could you do with them? Well, you could just rank your animals by performance, choose your best animals, and then refine that choice by the ones that are also low methane. Or you could use them alongside your performance BVs. And with a $50 carbon price, you could multiply your methane BV by minus $3.40 and, and, and add it to your index that way, and then re-rank your animals having added methane to the index. If you only choose on methane without using an index, you run the risk of selecting for smaller animals. Um, and and we, you know, we're trying really hard not to do that. Um, and, and we are, are, of course, working on more sophisticated ways of expressing the trait and, and indices. If you have had methane measured on the pack trailer, we are working on automated outputs for your flock. So this is the output for flock 2638. I've got a distribution of my traits. 
I've got my expectation of what methane will what will happen to methane over time, depending on the weight I decide to put on it. Um, and I've got what that looks like in terms of methane progress and my index progress. So we can do that for any index. Um, so um, this is something that um, Pavitra has been working really hard on with John, that we can give you the metrics that you need to decide whether this is something that's useful for you and something you want to continue with. And I want to really, you know, emphasize that this is a choice. This is, this is an option based on if this trait is going to affect your profitability, should you include it in your index and, and only you can decide that. So new developments going forward are indices and economic weights and uh, Abacus Bio is working on the economic weights. Beef and lamb are, are working on access to ram team BVs. Uh, we are working on gene flow models for your flock based on your ram team. So how much methane you save based on all of your ram team um, and expressing it in a format that government calculators understand. So if it's the government that starts driving price and we need to prove to them that we've made an impact, we want our BVs to express so it feeds straight into the MPI calculator so that the values are, are, are the same as, the, the, as their targets and their values. Um, and we, we have a program working alongside the inventory team to make sure that happens. Um, and as I've said, we're looking at automated sensitivity analyses for your flock and your index so you have an informed choice. Um, of, of of continuing, and I realise that I've um I've 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 run quite quite late, so um, I'm just going to skip a little bit through the next um couple of slides, and, and then I'll finish up. So in terms of um, what we're doing next, we are following the woodlands flock, and we're looking at stackability. So we're looking at other mitigation technologies and management, and and trying to really stay ahead of of, of the curb. We're working with other countries. Um, other countries are being hit by these targets just as hard, if not in some cases in Europe, harder than we are. So we are helping them with technologies, with protocols, um, and, and, and basically working with them. And we're also getting our results validated in other systems in other countries so that we trust uh, that the trait relationships that we see here are, are the same globally. And, and that's a really nice uh, independent validation for us. We're working uh, um, across countries, so we're working in particular with Ireland in sheep, cattle, um, to really look at other predictors, uh, and 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 we're looking at um, looking at microbial samples for prediction. We're looking at milk and meat fatty acid samples for for prediction, um, and and really looking for the next generation of predictors. And what that means is, what we hope is that we don't have to roll up everyone's driveway with a pack trailer. We can either take a, a swab uh, for, a, for a microbial sample or we can take a meat test or a milk test and, and, and predict methane that, that way based on, on the fat differences that, that we've seen come right through the animal. Um, and I will finish up there. Great. Thanks, Suzanne. Um, good to hear what else is happening across the, um, the industry and, and other countries as well as here. Um, as I mentioned to everyone at the start of the webinar, keep those questions coming through. Good to see a few rolling through. Um, we are planning a dedicated Q&A session shortly after Jason and I run the next session. Um, so now I'd like to welcome Jason to um, further reiterate the goal of the methane BV and what we're working with currently. Over to you, Jason. Thanks, Sharon. I'll be quick. I've only really got two slides or two things to say, really. <clears throat> Um, one is, and, and Suzanne really covered a lot of this anyway, but um, ultimately the goal here in terms of the BV format, which we've been um, discussing quite a bit um, with AgriSearch and with Abacus Bio, is to have a BV for methane yield um, so that we're actually looking at the efficiency um, of the beef not breeding for, as, as um, Suzanne said, um, lower intake sheep. Um, and so ultimately our goal is to to get this to a methane yield BV, um, to, and that will reduce the correlation with growth. Um, it's easier to consider the EBV um, as an EBV in its own right, um, and it also makes um, it into a format which is compatible for inclusion into any environmental calculator, or most environmental calculators. Um, it also helps us um, with index development, and so we are going to be developing um, indexes which actually take account of 
both this BV, but also the implications for feed intake um, and methane emission for all your other EBVs. Um, so, for example, as you, well, everything we do in sheep breeding really is is trying to improve the feed efficiency of those animals. Um, you know, higher reproductive rate, um, better stability, um, all those sort of things, all improve the efficiency. And so, in our indexes, we want to incorporate those efficiency gains that we make. Um, into um, the calculations that we get. So that's the goal. Um, in, the in, in the interim, um, Suzanne mentioned that the BV at the moment is the gross emissions, um, which is strongly correlated with feed intake and growth. So it needs to be balanced against those traits. And that and Suzanne also mentioned that you need to use that index, that, that EBV in an index as part of the index. So um, at the moment, um, that's what we'll do. Um, but and we need to work on the um, moving to an alternative format, which will be probably in a year, maybe two years' time, um, when we'll have an alternative format for methane yield um, as, as an EBV. But in the meantime, um, if you use the EBV as recommended um, in an index, it's going to take you in broadly the same direction um, anyway. So so it's not really um, you're not going to be going completely the wrong way. Um, if I could just have the next slide, please, Sarah or team. So the other the other um, question is that really, as a commercial farmer, how do I show anyone that I'm making um, improvements in my environmental efficiency? And how would I get the credit for um, for buying a a ram which might improve my methane um, profile? So. On the left, we've got the ram breeder who is um, who is obviously producing rams, measuring methane, and um, we are producing EBVs and sending those back to the breeder to make selection decisions. And so, um, the commercial farmer, which is the the farmer in the centre with the with the black sheep, um, comes along and and buys um, one of those rams. So, how do we get that credit? What we're proposing uh, is that we um, will create a, a facility whereby you can log which rams um, you've purchased over, and over time um, using gene flow theory um, at a commercial level we'll be able to tell you what approximately at the flock level um, approximately what's your average BV for um, methane. It won't just be methane. We'll use the same thing to say, well, okay, approximately, once we've created infrastructure, we can use the same t um, techniques to say, what's my average BV um, for number of lambs born, for example. And so when I go to make ram purchase decisions, having that information um, will help me, will help you more generally. Um, that, um, that EBV, the flock level EBV, can then be used um, alongside your farm data into an emissions calculator. And that might be, um, and you know this is all yet to be determined um, to get emissions credits for um, improvement with the government, but it might also be for market claim. So um, for meat companies who who may um, choose to um, market this with environmental market products with environmental um, claims against them, then this would be one way of doing this. So um, that will be obviously a secure system. Um, as a commercial farmer, you would have a login for that system um, and you would log which rams you've purchased um, over time. So that's really all I wanted to say, Sarah. Um, I'll pass back to you and let you continue. Thanks, Jason. Um, now I'm going to play a short video uh, on how we can utilise this information and improve currently. So I'll ask the team to play the video, hopefully. So now we've heard a little about what the current breeding value in a future index may include. Let's have a look at some of the tools available to us currently that we can utilise to, um, to look at this information. So we'll start with the public improve site, which um, note the web address up here, improve.nz. Um, we're going to start with maternal uh, flocks and breed, breeders, um, and then we're going to go to choose traits. So for anyone that hasn't been on the website, you'll notice these prompts come up to help guide you in your selections. Um, now, for this exercise, I'm just going to focus on methane, but by no means am I suggesting that anyone should single trait select here. So for both commercial farmers and breeders, you're more than likely to be using a combination of maternal indexes, 
production indexes, health indexes, or a range of other breeding values here. But as I mentioned, for this exercise, we're gonna focus on methane. So if you go to the far right of the, of the um, breeding value options, we're gonna see the methane um, breeding values here. So we've got methane emissions and carbon dioxide emissions. We're just gonna focus on methane. So for a commercial farmer, focusing on trying to make improvements in this area, you're more than likely to want above average animals or breeders performing in this trait. So hence, I've moved it to the bottom, uh, to exclude the bottom 50% of, of flocks here. We'll go continue and have a look at some breeder results. So what's happening here, based on our selection criteria, which in this case is just that single trait, we have our results ranked by likeness to that criteria. So in, that, in this instance, that is methane. So we're ranked on methane for all the all the recording flocks uh, recorded in Sill and Improve. So you'll notice we go from eight down to 18 in that first line. And as we keep scrolling, that number starts to reduce. And if we jump a bit further to the bottom, you'll start noticing some of these breeders um, listed here don't actually have the graphic for pack CH4 breeding value. This indicates that they are still recording this trait, so that they may well still be of interest and are still an option for you, but they are just not benchmarked. So for breeders, benchmarked is another word for connected. Uh, at this stage, we don't have um, methane listed here in these key traits, but that is part of a new development that will roll out in the near future. Uh, but at this stage, Recording breeders that aren't connected or benchmarked still show in this manner so that you can still see they're an option. So if we jump to the animal results for a second, again, these will be ranked by likeness and they start at 0%. In this case, that would be something like 0.1 or 0.2, um, which is why it's just a whole number of zero. And the further down we go, the more that number will reduce. So if you were a breeder looking to identify yourself in this instance, what you could do is jump back into your breeder results and you can actually start typing in the search bar here your flock name or your flock code and flag yourself so that when you look at the breeder results, uh, sorry, the animal results, you'll notice that's gone from all to just one breeder. So therefore, all the animal results showing now are just from that one flagged breeder. What you could do here is actually have a look at the results of these animals as a table and actually export this into a um, Excel spreadsheet to look further at those, at those numbers. Here we're showing the percentiles. You can actually change um, into actual values by clicking the advanced cog in the top right corner selecting actual values, which will change that from percentiles to actuals, hitting continue, and then that will give us some actual numbers here. If this was something you were interested in as a breeder, what you might be more likely to do is actually jump into improve breeder and have a look at this in, um, in a quick view or in a quick view that your bureau may have created for you. So in this situation, I've created a quick, a quick view, including methane. So in this instance, I'm suggesting it might be a RAM selection list, which includes a number of indexes and also the PACCH4 breeding value. So just to describe what I've got here, I'm using the latest single step evaluation. I've selected FLOP4640, which is our Invermay CPT. I've restricted to um, the 22 birth year and to males only. So what I've got listed here is the current tags of um, those animals fitting the criteria set here. Um, I've got their sire IDs, their birth, um, genetic birth dams, uh, their combined 
birth ID as an individual, the birth year, and then alongside all of that, I've got some the maternal worth index, maternal worth plus meat, and all of um, these sub indices here alongside the pack breeding value. So you can refine this or you, you can ask your bureau to refine this view any way you like. Um, that might include a number of extra sub indices or breeding values to go alongside it uh, based on what you might be looking to include in your own criteria. But what you can also do from here is export this view into an Excel spreadsheet. We're going to look at that now. And so what this shows on the front page or the first tab is um, the criteria or the, the run information that we've used to create this information, uh, the criteria that we've got listed and the weightings of the indexes that you've included. In the second tab, we've got exactly what you've just seen on improve. And from here, you can manipulate this information to, to rank animals based on whatever you like. At the moment, it's currently based on tag number, so it's in tag order. So if you wanted to do a bit more on the methane side, what you can do is actually filter that based on smallest to largest, given that a smaller breeding value in this case is more desirable and then start looking at your combination of other traits alongside it. As I mentioned, you can add in any additional columns here to include uh, any further indices or breeding values that you like or raw trait information so that you can use this to uh, fit whatever selection criteria your particular enterprise requires, or you can use it as the basis for potentially a sale catalogue or sale day information for your clients. Okay, now what we're going to do for the remainder of the webinar is to have our dedicated Q&A session. So all of our speakers from this evening will be available to answer the questions that have come through. So I'll start um, from where we jumped on to start with, so Neil Henderson had the first question. Um, what will be the difference to global temperature if we reduce New Zealand's sheep emissions by 50%? I don't think there's anybody on here qualified. I, I don't think we have any climate scientists, so I don't think we can answer that. Um, that's that's for the, the climate scientists to answer. Yeah, I agree, Suzanne. It's um, it's a climate question. But also, the, the premise of the question is that no one else will do anything either. Um, that we're the only people who will be doing something. And having been to international science conferences, I, I can assure you that's that won't be the case. Uh, the next question was from Blair and Jane Smith. What unintended consequences of this breeding program have been evaluated? Ah, oh, so we've we've obviously looked at all of the um maternal traits, survival, um, we've we've looked at composition of meat, um, we have looked at all of the physiological traits that we can think of, um, we haven't looked at facial eczema, um, so that's one, that's one gap um, that I can think of that um, I, I think would be really useful. Um, but we're gradually starting to get, you know, flocks that have bred for facial eczema that also have low methane breeding values that, that we can look at. Um, I, I guess my question to that would be, um, what are the ill effects that, you know, that, that we obviously haven't looked at? I've, I've given you the list of the traits that we've looked at. What haven't we looked at that, that you would like us to look at and that you feel is important to look at um, before, you know, you, you made the decision that, that it was something that, that you were prepared to breed for? Um, you know, our, our door is open. Um, another question from Blair and Jane Smith. The market is paying considerable 
premiums for higher IMF strongly correlated with overall fat? Why would a farmer compromise that? Yeah, again, everybody should put the the emphasis on on what's important to them. Uh, what we do see with the when we do fat, full fatty acid profiles is that although we get less short chain fatty acids, we get um, a lot of polyunsaturated fatty acids, more branch chain fatty acids, uh, conjugated linoleic acids. So, the fatty acid profile that we see in the meat um, is 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 a good one it is an optimal one uh, so we're not seeing an impact on on meat quality but but if you're if you're selecting for fat and you want more fat then you know you need to make sure that your index is your personal index is weighted accordingly yeah i guess i'll i'll add to that you, you can select for you know it's, it's a free market here you can select for whatever you like um and you know animal breeding is about making compromises in terms of um what emphasis we put on what trait. Um, one of the things I think that Suzanne's team has shown um, is that actually methane doesn't have a lot of um, strong antagonisms. If anything, most of those um, most of those relationships are either neutral or slightly favourable. Um, and there is a sweet spot where you can put a bit of emphasis, make some progress in methane without sacrificing um, progress, uh, much progress in, in a lot of other traits. But you're cool. Your breeding objective, your sheep, your call. Uh, the next question was from Sean Newland. Um, if we're making slight progress in methane reduction without any methane focus, does that mean other traits being focused on are somehow already methane linked? I think it's probably just the penalty on you, like weight. Uh, Ross Richards asked, uh, for the data on the rams sent to Lanacos to be relevant, surely the other rams should have been compared under Southland conditions as well? I mean, we could. We could take the other rams and, and put them in, in Southland, but I would expect them to express their, their breeding values um, just as well. You know, I mean, what we saw was that the BBs that were expressed at Woodlands, um, when we then took the animals and, and measured them in another environment, we got the same BBs. So those BVs were seen to be true. Um, we didn't get a BV based on an ideal environment, which fell over when we put it in a harsh environment. And that's all we were really trying to determine. Uh, Deborah Alexander asked, uh, given IPCC AR6 has lowered methane's impact by three or four and GWP100 is considered overstated and CO2 is based on methane, at the higher values, then does that change your $50 up to $200 per tonne? No, it probably goes the opposite in a way. Um, so, um, you know, if if we look at the, the the global warming equivalent type analyses and those metrics, then to to achieve our targets, we may actually need to reduce methane by less uh, than what the government first thought. So we, we may be able to put... Um, less emphasis or, or or hit our targets much much sooner i mean the current targets breeding is not going to meet that within the time frame um if, if the targets were lower maybe maybe breeding would 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 meet those targets by itself um but that you know the the, the way that we value the metric isn't going to change what we can do physically uh, the next question was from jock allison what is your interest in myth 100? That, that is, methane is an irrelevant greenhouse gas. Detailed discussions with all those involved might just be fruitful. Completely ignoring credible science isn't usually recognized, a recognised component of the scientific method. Yeah, I mean, yes, I'm not, sorry. I'm, I'm not ignoring any, any climate science um, at all. Uh, as, as an animal breeder, my you know, I, I look at traits that may or may not affect profit and look at whether they could be included in the profit index and what the impact of that would be. So um, if methane, and, and at the moment it looks as though um, it's probably market signals or 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 financial lenders that, that are going to drive that sort of carbon zero or carbon neutral um, conversation, particularly overseas. So um, we're looking at it purely from if it's a if it's a, a trait that you know that that has a value and therefore it's profitable to breed for it, what happens when we put it into our index? I can't comment on the climate science, and I'm not going to. 
Sorry, Jason, did you want to add anything to that? Oh, no, I was pretty much going to say this. the same comment about climate science that Suzanne just said. Cool. Okay, uh, Deborah Alexander also asked, in the chamber, have you tested for real conditions rather than just set feed, i.e. wetter weather, different areas, different temperature? Yeah, well, if you talk to our technicians, they've been wet, they've been cold. Um, you know, I think we've been in every every envi environment imaginable. Um, so, yeah, we, we've certainly tested a, a range of conditions. Um, in wet weather, the, the, the main thing is that the yeah, with the sheet being wet, they affect the, the filter, the hydroscopic filter that's in the um, eagle. So we often have to, to change those filters on an hourly basis rather than a half daily or a daily basis. So we have to adjust our protocols uh, depending on, on, on the environment. We don't measure in a frost. We find that uh, sub-zero temperatures, they affect the, the measurements and, and the val valve. Um, so yeah, there's, there's, there's a few things that, that, that we need to sort of adjust uh, in, in harsh environments. But yeah, we've, I think we've tested most of them, certainly in, under New Zealand conditions. Uh, Helen Mandira asked, have you considered the high amount of stress and therefore elevated stress hormones such as cortisol that the animals in the chambers would be experiencing, which would definitely have an impact on downstream methane levels? So we haven't measured um, cortisol itself. We don't actually see any indication of stress. The animals are really relaxed and if they look stressed, we let them out. Uh, but I guess the, the the main thing is that, you know, all of the animals are treated exactly the same and, and they're all treated and, and, and compared at, at the same level. Um, but, but yeah, often sheep lie down in the chambers um, and, and we don't see any, um, we have a very, very strict animal ethics code. So if we saw stressed animals as, you know, we, we wouldn't be able to operate. Uh, Hamish Pauski asked, are you comparing emissions eating low ME feed as well? Yeah, we're trying to. Uh, so uh, we've uh, run uh, rams for a year in the North Island uh, uh, under dry conditions and under different conditions. I personally would like to do more in that area. Um, I would like to um, invest more in in measuring use on you know on really poor feed for 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 a year or so. Um, but you know it's 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 getting the the funding to to do it. And we did test that as we developed the trait through the science program where we were testing it in seasons and in different feeds. And there was a, a set, I recall, we set a you know, very low quality feed and the highs remain high and the lows remain low. It was pretty consistent across that high quality feed because it's obviously a real key issue um, taking something from the experimental kind of place uh, out to the, the uh, commercial farm. Uh, Andrew Bendel asked, why is this getting pushed through so quickly? The fun fundamentals of a profitable U hasn't really changed over, over 50 years. A U to last in good condition for six years, rearing above average twins every year. We just need to identify more of these U's commercially. Um, um, I don't I don't think it's being pushed through quickly. I think we spent 14 years on the, on the research programme. But go on, Jason, you can... Yeah, well, I was, I was going to say something very similar. I don't think, I wouldn't say it's been pushed through quickly at all. Um, in any new trait that comes along, there's a research phase, there's an early uptake phase, and, and then it becomes mainstream. I think, you know, um, at this point, we're, we're right at the start of actually making it available to industry. Um, and, yep, I totally agree that we need to um, to get used that last and good condition for six years or more, um, et cetera. And, you know, I don't think this is, saying that we that we're going to go backwards in any of those traits um, by by doing this so um, you know that, that, again that's animal breeding we've got, we want multiple traits we're trying to manage antagonisms there aren't a lot of antagonisms with this trait um, and we're all trying to achieve that that profitable and efficient you um, Hamish Bowski asks uh, what are your assumptions that the whole industry is going to make those gains over the next decades? So no trade-offs in individual productive and health traits. Is this assuming we will be nudged with a tax? Um, we, we're not making any assumptions at this point. So what we're saying is that when we look at um, how the indexes behave, um, if we insert methane, um, that we think that 
half percent progress um, a year in methane would mean that we maintain pretty much all of our progress in the other traits. We, you know, with very very slight loss in in progress, um, and we still manage to make gain in methane. So so we've pitched. You know, we know that we could go faster. Um, but we've pitched it at a level that doesn't impact us breeding for um, profitability in other traits. Um, but again, it's entirely up to everyone where they choose to put that economic weight. Uh, Ross Richards asked, is the reduction in size of the low methane line simply because you are not correcting the PEC methane results for the size of the animal? So we, we breed for low methane per unit of feed intake. Um, so that's what we're selecting for. Uh, we're not selecting for, for smaller animals. Uh, the, other, the other part of that, sorry, that Ross, is, is when it comes to, in practice, um, if we don't want our animals to get smaller, we can increase the weighting on, on or decrease the, the penalty on, on adult, adult U weight. Um, so again, you know, we've got levers on these things. We we can produce um, pretty much the direction of travel that that we want if we if we measure. Uh, next, we've got a question from Michael Aldridge. Uh, what tipped the scales towards methane yield over methane intensity? Um, so, I mean, one of the reasons that we have absolute methane is that we can develop whatever trait we like. If we want to look at methane intensity, we can. Um, the The global targets that have been set for all countries are the lowering of absolute methane emissions, not methane intensity. So um, that's what we're looking at. I'll also add to that. Um, I talked about us adding to our indexes um, an option anyway to be able to account for um, the importance that um, there are efficiency gains that we're making at, and the impact that they have on essentially methane intensity. So um, if you improve your reproductive rate, if you improve your growth rates, then you also improve your, your methane intensity. And we want to be able to um, count that and recognise that in our indexes. Uh, the next question from Kate Broadbent. Uh, $4.2 million, can you direct any of this towards feed efficiency? Jason, I think that was for you. Uh, yep, love to, Kate. Um, and some of this work has had some feed efficiency um, uh, measures taken alongside it. Um, one of the other things that Suzanne, I don't think, didn't mention um, is some of the other proxy um, measurements that um, that we might end up um, being able to use such as um, rumen microbiome samples and um, those proxies are actually looking pretty positive in terms of not only being correlated with methane but actually also potentially being able to be used to help predict feed intake and, and efficiency. So um, yep, we'll try and get as much as much benefit out of um, out of those other traits, um, feed efficiency as we can along the way. Uh, another question for you, Jason, from Blair and Jane Smith. How can you make an index if you do not know what the cost of methane will be? Yeah, good question. Um, so um, what you can do with indexes, um, so we talk about economic indexes a lot, um, but actually um, there's also something called desired gains indexes, which means that you can uh, put weightings on traits according to how much progress you do or don't want to make. Um, and we can actually, um, I guess, um, alter the the economic weighting that we put on methane until we get to a point where we're comfortable that we're making some gains in methane, but we're not compromising our productive traits um, too much. And, and Suzanne showed that and, and sort of showed that, that right at the moment that looks like um, for the average sort of situation, that might be a cost of about $50 a tonne. Um, so yeah, we can make indexes um, and, you know, actually um, breeders all the time are, are um, are actually imposing desired gains on, on top of their indexes anyway. Uh, I think this one's for you, Suzanne, from Hamish Bowski. Woodlands Research Flock 2638 averages well into the negatives for body condition score on improve, not fit for purpose so for so many hill country farms. Um, I don't think we're that 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 low. Uh, we certainly get our um, animals in um, lamb every year, so um, some something's working. 
um sorry being defensive about my own flock apologies um yeah so i mean the, the animals went went really well in in canterbury and uh, and the offspring you know that the, the hoggets got got in lamb and, and got in lamb better than the the hoggets from other rams so um we we haven't seen any issues to date we measure body condition score and you know and we keep an eye on it and yeah we we haven't seen any issues and I'm I'm not saying that we need to send flock two six three eight animals up up to to Northland. What I'm saying is in Northland, you can select for low methane, um, and you know and and add an optimal weight, and it shouldn't have any impact on on on, on the other traits, uh, and very little impact on on the body condition score, um, of of your animals. So you know we're really looking at people selecting their own animals in their own environment, just as they have done for, for, for centuries. Um, this is an open question to the group uh, from Andrew Bendel. Why don't we invest in EID and DNA on commercial farms and get accuracy of who are our efficient use? Uh, so I can take that one. Um, yeah, absolutely, Andrew. Um, I think, um, you know, a lot of people are actually investing in EID at, at um, in commercial use, or maybe I should say some people rather than a lot of people. Um, and I think EID certainly is at the point where on, on a U basis, not, I'm not talking about tagging every lamb, um, but on U basis, you know, I think there is a, a value proposition there. Um, DNA, um, yep, if, if we could, um, but, you know, it is there isn't a, a greater expense associated with that. So um, it's probably, I suspect, right at this point of time, not quite at the point where it's... Um, Economic to do on a commercial basis. I'm talking about not on a not on a ram breeding flock, um, but absolutely. Uh, Jason, I think this has got your name on it from Hamish Falski. Why an environment efficiency index instead of calling it a methane efficiency index? Oh, well, we could call it a methane efficiency index. We haven't actually named an index, right? But um, I think environmental, from a marketing point of view, if, if we're talking about using this to support product attributes overseas, probably calling an environmental index is, is um, one, probably smarter, um, but secondly, it gives us the, the ability if there are other um, environmental traits that we can build into this or, or and animal welfare traits, um, you know, let's, let's leave ourselves open to doing that in, in the future as well. Uh, now, just acknowledging we're at um, 8.30, uh, we have another I think it's 10 or so questions to get through, which we'll try and endeavour to, to nail in, that, um, in the next 10 minutes or so, but appreciate that some of you may have to drop off given the time. Um, Jason, I think this has got you next to it. A uh, question from Graham Gleeson. I think the methane economic weighting will need to be scrutinised with care because a carbon price set on fossil fuel CO2, GWP 100 emissions value via the ETS or similar, probably does not reflect well the importance of food nutritional value in balanced diets and other market attributes having value. Uh, yeah, that's probably talking talking um, beyond my, my level of knowledge in terms of um, the detail of that, but absolutely um, when we come to set these economic values, we, we take a lot of care. Um, Abacus normally um, produces our, our indexes for us um, in sheep um, and they will World recognised experts in this area. Uh, question for you, Suzanne from Cape Broadbent. Uh, how many years has the Woodlands maternal flock been using low methane rams or selecting for low methane? Uh, so we started in 2018 measuring the lambs themselves and selecting in the index. Uh, prior to that, we were taking. Um, one low, so we have 22 sire lines in the flock, and each year we were using one low methane line um, to connect and basically to look at other traits. Um, but 2018 in earnest. Uh, the next question is I think you, Jason, from Neil Henderson. Are you aware that farmers who understand the real role of methane are going to boycott breeders who get the pack trailer? Uh, no, I'm not aware of that. Um, look, it's a free market. Everyone makes their decisions. Um, that 
that would be something that everyone could think about and, and uh, if they believe that will happen then they can make the decision based on that. Uh, next question I think is probably either of you, Suzanne or Jason. Um, from Norm Alderson, methane breeding values need to be calculated back to kilos of meat produced to total kilos of methane emitted. Surely anything short of this calculation is a compromise. Uh, yeah, I can take that. Um, so indexes are about profit, really. Um, you can do end up, you know, you can calculate them profit per per you, profit per um, kilogram of feed eaten. Um, you can do them on a bunch of different bases. Um, the way we have done them in New Zealand, and and it's actually really a standard way, um, is to do it as as some sort of profit per per animal, so per you. Um, so. No, I don't think that anything short of that is a compromise, um, but um, it's going to tell you that it's going to take you in, in the same direction anyway, or a similar direction, I should say. Uh, question for you, Suzanne, from Deborah Alexander. Um, why have you measured CO2 emissions? I did not know it was being counted in agricultural emissions. Worried that they may progress to targeting humans that breathe out 40,000 parts per million per breath. Yeah, so there's two reasons that we measure CO2. One is that we've got an animal in an enclosed space and um, um, CO2 is rising. So um, just, just to keep an eye on those CO2 levels. Uh, so one's from an animal welfare perspective. Uh, and the second is that um, when you take the total gases emitted, they are indicative of the animal's uh, metabolic rate. Um, and so they're, they're basically a function of the, of the life weight of the animal and, and how much it's eating. So if we know the life weight of the animal, actually, we can get a really good um, estimate of feed intake or feed efficiency from CO2. So, yeah, firstly, for welfare, but two, we think it might be a really useful trait uh, to use in future. Nothing to do with the environment. Uh, the next one, I think, actually has David Campbell's name on it, so hopefully he can unmute uh, from where he is. Uh, from Blair and Jane Smith, have Beef and Lamb Genetics ever found out how many farmers use Improve? Because I would like to know. Um, we um, we do collect some metrics. Um, there are some analytics connected, collected, but unfortunately, it doesn't identify individual farmers because it's it's basically anonymous use. So it's more about the, the numbers of, of users of that tool. So unfortunately we can't we can't turn that into um, specific numbers of farmers, but we can see the trends of it and the growing adoption, which which um, looks really good. Thanks, David. Uh, Suzanne, question from Ross Richards. Why was the Woodlands flock not top of the improved list when that flock has had more selection for methane than any other? Uh, so the the selection line flock doesn't come up because they're run as a single flock. So the highs um, knock out the lows, so they come out as average. Uh, and the other flock, it'll be based on the fact that, you know, we we select for uh, maternal index, we select for parasite resistance. So so we, we have a bunch of traits that we select for and um, methane is, is added to the index. Um, so, it, you know, it, it'll just be what comes out in the wash. Uh, Jason, I think this has got you, uh, from Neil Henderson. If you don't know the effect on global temperature, how can you be sure this research is economically and environmental, but environmentally justifiable? Yeah, so the reason Ag Research has done this research really is because of um, the weight of evidence that seems to be coming internationally from, from um, a large panel of scientists. I know not everyone on this, on this call believes um, that that's the case. Um, I'd like it not to be the case, but um, that's the evidence, and and so therefore that's that's why the research has been done. Uh, this is an open question to all. Um, question from Blair and Jane Smith: Given that the cost-benefit analysis of this project was done using GWP100 as the atmospheric warming potential. Now that the beef and now that beef and lamb seem to be advocating for a different metric, GWP star, what does that analysis look like now? If so the latest the, science, sorry, I'll just so, so, 
the rate of return on investment is is higher with if if global warming potential is used um so one of the things that we do have to be careful about so with the with the warming equivalent it means that for every half a gram of methane that we lower it's it's worth a lot more um because it's lowering temperature by um by by more than we we predicted and and, and therefore you know we we we're doing a lot a lot better job of it um the flip side of that and something that i think we need to be a, a little bit cautious about is that if if lowering methane is valued much more highly because of we're using the warming potential then if we expand our enterprises increases in methane will also be valued um much more highly so so the cost of expansion will be more um but we won't need to to lower methane by quite as much to 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 hit target so um yeah that the 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 cost benefit is um is good if we're lowering um but if if we're putting methane into the environment then um i think we'll yeah we'll it, it'll cost us more uh, the more, second more part methane the environment, think, yeah. yeah the second part of that question was if the latest science is accepted and methane is shown to be irrelevant then will this program be terminated uh, yeah, very much so. I mean, you know, we're animal breeders. If um, you know, we we breed for what's profitable. So out of this program has come some really neat uh, microbial analysis for for feed efficiency. Uh, some really interesting physiological stuff on on, on rumens. Uh, so there's a whole heap of really really useful science that's come out of this program uh, that you know we we would take in another direction uh, if we didn't need to put selection pressure on on methane emissions. Then um, you know, nobody would be turning off the lights here. There's there's plenty to do. Uh, another question for you, Suzanne, from Hamish Bowski. Have you researched the effects of how low methane use on lower ME, i.e. hill country, perform over time? Uh, so, again, something that we'd really like to do. We took the low methane selection lines and we fed them really, really poor quality diet. Um, and we've done that for a small number of animals. And what we saw was that they ranked the same. Um, there's no reason why a low methane ewe should not cope um, in, in a low ME environment. Um, there's no biological reason why they would cope any less than an, any other ewe. Um, there's, yeah, so so um, it would be really nice to monitor ewes for several years. What we can do now though, is look at the people in those low environments who have engaged and measured their animals and we can look at those animals and we can see what's happening in those environments with those animals that have been measured. And that's probably more useful information for everybody. Uh, another question from Ross Richards. I think this was in relation to his earlier question. I think Jason, you answered, uh, but what is available to breeders at present is not corrected for feed intake. I think that was in relation to the breeding value. Uh, yeah, that's that's true, Ross, and that's exactly why we need to put to use it alongside the index um, at this point of time, so that we're getting um, the accounting for feed intake through the index. Um, but we will move um, when we can once we've done the work um, to correcting it for feed intake, essentially. Uh, another question has come through from Sue Mazaros. Apologies if I've mispronounced that. Did you see any breed differences or was there not enough data to draw conclusions? No, if you look at that graph with all those flocks across lots and lots of different breeds, we basically see similar variation in, in every single flock and every single breed, um, which really does tell us that it's a fairly benign trait. Another question from Hamish Bowski. Should we then get paid to use these rams if lowering better under GWP star is so good for New Zealand? Potentially. Potentially. If you know, if 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 the, if it's having a big impact and it's you know, it's it's a value, then um absolutely, why not? Um, I think we're getting towards the end of our questions, so thanks all for sticking with us. Um, one from Aaron Meikle. 
One interesting thing from the NZGA, um, which I think is Grassland Association and NZSAP, Society of Animal Production Conference, you can't just transplant rumen flora and change the recipient animal. That's a question. Um, no, it, it doesn't. It doesn't appear so. So it seems to be a genetic component of the the host and the way they control their environment. Um, and when I first started looking at it, somebody explained to me that if if the host didn't control the the bugs in its gut, then the bugs would overwhelm it. So um, yeah, um, you don't seem to be able to just transplant um, low to high. It seems to just revert to the host sort of natural um, microbiome over time. Um, I think this might be our last one. It was a lengthy one, but we'll try and um, try and keep it keep it short. Uh, fearful that introducing a new focus, i.e. methane genetics, may hamper progress. Also worried about introducing new methane genetics may create a hybrid F1, F2 response. Looks good initially, but when stabilised five plus generations, may have a lower or reduced genetic value across multiple traits. Learned this from an endeavours to improve facial eczema tolerance, a 25 plus year journey, only now enjoying better FE tolerance. Yeah, well, I think it, performance is a slow burn with many ups and downs. And and I agree. And I think it's really, really important that we keep these flocks going and we stay ahead. You know, I think it's really important that if, if something is going to fall over, that the research flocks are two or three generations ahead. So we see it coming and, you know, and, and we, 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 we report on an annual basis and say, look, this is what we're seeing. Um, and, and that's all, all we can do. You know, we don't have a crystal ball. We don't know what's going to happen in the future. Um, but currently, uh, there's nothing, you know, in, in, in the research that we have that shows that we expect any difference um, in the generations to come. So, um, yeah, just, just keeping a watching brief, keeping an eye and, and making, you know, keeping you guys informed of, of, of everything that we see. I guess if I can add to that, um, and I'm not quite sure whether I interpreted the question right as, as to whether we sort of run out of genetic variation after a while. Um, most, I don't know of any examples where, like I've always expected that we'd run out of genetic variation. I don't know of any examples where that's actually happened um, in in breeding programs. So um, I think we will be able to continue to make gains. Um, the question will be, do we do we reach a tipping point where something else becomes um, a bigger priority or a bigger issue. Um, so, yeah. yeah cer certainly research that's been done in, in, in animals that have much shorter generation intervals uh, from mice through to pigs um, on, on many traits has shown that you can have 20 plus generations and, and still not see any, any reduction in additive genetic variation, um, which as Jason says, is, is a surprise to, to all of us, but um, we never seem to run out of it. Cool. Well, I think we've managed to get through most of the questions. There might be a couple we've missed um, in the wrap up, but uh, for any that have been missed, we will endeavour to answer these um, in the email that comes out uh, following this webinar with the link to the recording of the webinar. Um, if there's any further information on anything you've heard tonight that you require, then please just email us at info at blnzgenetics.com. But on behalf of the Cool Sheep Project, we sincerely thank you all for taking time out of your evenings to join us tonight. We appreciate it as a very busy time of year. Um, enjoy the rest of your evening and all the best for the season ahead. Thank you.